scripture reading is uh, from the book of Mark. It's chapter 12, and I'll be reading verses 38 through 44. And in his teaching, he said, Beware of the scribes who like to go about in long robes and to have salutations in the marketplaces and the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at feast, who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. And he sat down, the, down opposite the treasure and watched the multitude putting money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums. And a poor widow came and put in two copper coins, which make a penny. And he called his disciples to him, and he said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, her whole living. We opened this whole series on um, the gifts and the spiritual fruits um, that God calls us to cultivate and to develop in our lives with the anthem that the choir sang, One Step. Um, we would love to know the end story of what everything looks, of what the future holds for us, but we won't ever. What we do know is what the next step is in front of us. And that step that we can take trusting in the faithfulness of God and in the support and the accountability of our community. And so with one step, we have gone um, through this fall and we have started a new small group ministry with leaders coming forward um, so that we can better care for each other and be in deeper relationship with each other um, so that there is a core of support and of accountability. And as we each work in taking those next steps um, in our lives, so that we know that we are not alone, so that we know when we are trying to do something that is so different from the culture and from everyone around us in terms of neighbors and coworkers, there's a place where we can come to see again that we are not alone, that we're not crazy, that we really are about something and to have that support and that care um, of each other walking, walking with. And so we come to this day to celebrate all that is before us. Um, our leaders have uh, completed their training, and when we get back from Thanksgiving, we're going to be looking at logistics and sending invitations out. Um, and we'll have an Advent study here coming up for the month of December. But then in January, we will start in groups um, praying together in each other's homes and building that relational tissue. Um, that we all need to be able to step out in faithfulness, to make that next faithful step, trusting that although it's as nerve-wracking as it can be, there are others who go with us. There are others who have already taken the step that we are working at taking that stand as a witness um, to help us have the courage to make it. And then there are those that we will be able um, to testify and witness to ourselves in, in looking at what has been hard in taking that step, but what has been worth it. And so we come to this Sunday to do this work together. And when we speak of financial work, it's a hard thing. But I want to say today how important financial giving is because of the power that finance, that money carries. And that is what this parable of the um, widow was talking about. Remember the way that this started, that there was an issue of justice of the temple of the synagogue not working the way that it should be and not caring for the widows as it should be. Do you remember that line of devouring the widows' homes? Here is a widow who comes and gives all of what she has to the very place that's not caring for her the way that it ought. There's a level of spiritual depth here that I am still working to aspire. Because for this widow, she could have easily said, right, I only have this to live on. That's all I have. 
I'm not even getting the support and care that I'm promised from the organizations that supposedly are there for me, to help me. But yet she still gives. She still gives because that is her truth and that is who she is and that that is the person that she is cultivating because that is something that is between her and God no matter what any other human being or system is doing. The only thing that she has complete control over is herself and she gives herself fully despite the fact that others have not given themselves fully Despite the fact that that's all that she has left, she still, even in that moment, is able to give control over to God and in faithfulness is able to live in a depth of perfection in terms of loving God and loving others as we love ourselves that I, quite frankly, still dream of and am still in very infant stages of doing compared to this widow. We do not own what we have. That's a huge countercultural statement. We are built on a country of pulling ourselves up by our bootstraps and gaining for ourselves as individual and through hard work and a beautiful work ethic. And I'm not saying that that's not important, but it brings, in terms of our faith, a false truth that we own what we have, that it's due to us because of who we are and what we've given. And according to scripture, that is simply not the case. And that's a truth that the widow understood, that God does in fact own everything, that we are here simply to be stewards. In the David Ramsey language we learned in Financial Peace University, we're here to be the asset managers of what we've been given. Barry, would you bring up the Exodus, um, the Deuteronomy passage? There are lots of passages that deal with tithing and what giving looks like. This is one of the clearest. Um, and a tithe is 10%, it's a 10th. And so what we're looking at here is looking at the percentage that we give. Now, most of us do not still work the land, and our well-being is not coming through first fruits, literal ones, anymore. But they, it is coming through the paychecks that we receive from our employment. And so the parallel to scripture here is to pay first a tenth of what we have been given um, back to God, um, back to the storehouse, back to giving to those who are in need of it today. Um, there are still widows and orphans and sojourners, um, immigrants that still need our support today. Um, there are others, and this is a Veterans Day. There are families um, with parents abroad um, that we need to support. There are single parent families that we need to support. We are to be a safety net. We are to gather what we have in for our own truth to know who really does own all these blessings and for the truth of others around us so that they are able, just like that manna gathering in the wilderness, to gather to have enough for what they and their tribe, their clan needs to survive. Um, I need one more slide back, please, Barry. Oh, I lied, one more. And so we begin by bringing this to the altar, the first fruits, because this is top priority. It's not after we've taken care of what we need and what we want. It's first, because we remember a wandering Aramean was my father. Yes, I'm living in a land flowing with milk and honey now, but once I was in a wilderness where I did not have anything to eat or to drink. And once I wasn't even just in a wilderness, we were in Egypt and we were treated harshly and afflicted in bondage. And we cried to the Lord, the God of our fathers, and the Lord heard our voice and saw our affliction, our toil, and our oppression, and the Lord brought us out of Egypt out of that dark place with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. 
with great terror and signs and wonders. And God brought us into this place and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And so behold, I bring the first fruit of the ground, which thou, O Lord, has given me. It's the story of remembering who we are. It's the story that was called to repeat time and time again because God knew how easy it is for us to set up an alternative reality, a different story other than the truth. And so this is the story that God calls us to ground us in. Now, our stories are a little bit different. My story would start with parents who set up a college fund for me so that I could go through my schooling debt-free for all of those who gave to scholarship funds at, Washington, at Wesley Theological Seminary that again gave me the chance to go through my master's program debt free. For all of those who have come together a part of the church and their faithful giving so that I can stand before you as a pastor and be paid and have the wherewithal to make this calling my vocation. There are plenty of my colleagues who do this while working other jobs because it is not possible for those in their congregations to put together the funds to make this the vocation. I stand here today because of the faithfulness of all of those people because of the blessings that have been a part of my life. I am who I am because of how God has been at work and how others have responded to that. My gift is not my own. And so I bring a tithe. I do not ask of you anything that I do not ask of myself. And so um, with a salary of just over 55000 Abraham and I are making a tithe of $6,500. Um, it's 11.5% of salary, but if you combine the housing allowance that you all give me, it's only 8.5% of that total. And the next step that we are taking is working on tithing both my salary and my housing allowance. Now, as most of you know, um, we went through a period of um, almost a year of unemployment for Abraham, um, and so we were blessed to have an emergency fund through that, but that got eaten down um, quite a bit, and then the car broke down, and we had to go in debt for the car. Life happens. And so now that Abraham's employed, um, we are giving 5% um, of his income. Um, we are not tithing that to the church. Um, we are giving that to other organizations that do other ministry um, that we believe in. Um, but we're still not at that 10% because we are still working to pay off our debt and we are still working to build, rebuild the emergency fund. I share, with this, I share this all with you as an example of what it means to be in process. A tithe is a big deal. 10% can be a lot. Um, but what is one step on that way? The next faithful step that you can take. We know that there are lots of financial needs and we want you to be good stewards of your resources and we want you to have those emergency funds and we want you to be out of debt and we want you to be stable. But we also want to hold this truth that what we have is not our own. And that there will always be someone who is worse off than we are. And it's not often that I am able to use a superlative and mean it. There will always be someone who is worse off than we are. And so no matter where we are in our stage, I do want us to figure out a way to give something. Because that is more about the truth and the spirit in which we are growing and cultivating ourselves than anything else. Will we be able to see the other? Will we be able to use our suffering and our fear to be able to increase our empathy, to be more aware of what other people are going through? Abraham and I went through a chapter of nine months. It has made me acutely aware of what our single parents go through every single day of their lives. 
May what we go through not shut us down and cause us to retreat and to hoard, but may we go through, be the suffering, be the passion that brings compassion, that opens our hearts to see the fights that others are wrestling with a new way, to know that God will care for us as we care for others, to know that we will give what we can, but that there is a time when we are called to redefine what can is in our lives. My very first moment of financial peace and giving was when I very first started out um, and finally met that goal of tithing seven years ago. And I met it and then in addition sponsored a child through Compassion International. And there was this one shop on 18th Street um, with all of you know me in color, right? All of these gorgeous scarves that were always out there. And every time I walked by this shop, I was like, oh, look at that blue. Oh, look at that orange. Oh, I don't have that one. And it was this poll every single time. But once I started sponsoring Franklin, I found peace because every single time I passed by that shop, I would see his face. And I would see my rack of scarves that I already had in my closet. And I would know with absolute certainty that I was making the right decision. That what Franklin needed was way more important than what that scarf was calling for. And it was the most liberating experience I have ever had of not having that tug anymore because I knew where my priorities were. I knew the values. I knew the work that I was doing. This moment of going through the unemployment with Abraham was another one of those moments. We have never had to be more intentional with our money. And you guys, it sucked. It was horrible. It was the most anxiety rented experience. And I needed the moments where Robin or where Elaine would come and say, we've been there, we've understand, and it feels like there is no way out and the world is collapsing but this will pass and know that it will be okay and there will be a way forward. There were those in this very community that were my witnesses for how to be faithful through this time. And now I know the depth that is created in me. We are saving and we are working off this car debt and double the amount of time because of Financial Peace University than we have before because of having a group where we came and there was weekly accountability, because we've all been there before, right? We know what we want to do, but do we actually take the time to do it? It's just like the gym. We know we feel better. We know it's going to be a better day if we get there, if we get to Zumba or aerobics or lifting, but do we actually do it when push comes to shove? We know all of it. What it is about is having small groups and having a community that will walk this road with us that will not judge us for when we make mistakes and when we can't be the full persons that we want to be, but will be there to say how they've been there, that will be there to not let it go, to not let this goal go or not let us sidestep it and hold us to it, but in love. Because the point is, guys, we got to dream bigger. Because this is what I share with the Financial Peace University and the way David Ramsey um, teaches. We have given over so much of our imaginations and what can be possible through us because of how we live culturally and how we respond to the consumerism that is around us every single day to the ads that pull us. We as Methodists were the one that started the colleges and the hospitals around us. There are youth in our cities that are dying because of overdoses and because of gun violence. So what is it going to look like if we can work ourselves out of debt, both as a church and as individuals? What is it going to look like if we choose differently where to live and how to live, and we choose to live below our means so that we can have that much more available to our giving so that we can set up centers with all of the United Methodist churches in our area and to have a place for kids to come to know that they are loved, to know their worth, and to know that there is another way 
to deal with the pain and the stress that they are so that they don't feel tempted? What does it mean to be in those apartment complexes where the drug deals are happening by the playground centers? What does it mean for us to set up ESL classes so that people can learn the language and be able to get employment that they never had access to before? What does it mean for us to be the body of Christ in a way that means if something happened to Epworth, God forbid, that closed us down tomorrow, every single person in Cockeysville would notice and would be affected because of who we are and because of the transformation that comes from this church. That is what I want. And that is what I want us to take one next faithful step towards today. Because we serve a God who, her, who hears the cries of pain and suffering, who knows the turmoil of what it means to be caught without hope, and who comes down to deliver. So may we be the Moses that comes and walks with our communities. May we be the people who take a next faithful step up to the Red Sea And God uses us to part its waters and make a way forward where there was none. This is the transformation that can be ours if we let God use us the way the widow let God use her. May we be the church that if we close tomorrow, every single person would notice and would be affected. This is our discipleship commitment to take a next faithful step. So if you've never given anything, consider giving something this coming year. If you've given something, but you've never made an official commitment through your pledge, you've never made it your first priority, what you give to first, take that step. If you've given a percentage of your income already, take a step in increasing that percentage towards a tithe. If you already tithe, then I'm afraid you're not off the hook because the end of our Deuteronomy passage calls us to a third year of offering where every three years another tithe is taken in addition to the annual tithe, and that is to cover the needs of the immigrant, the widow, and the orphan. So where are the extra offerings that you can give, whether that's through UMCOR and the people who are rebuilding their houses in the South, whether that is for youth programs here, whether that is for black-led organizations, where are the places of vulnerability that need the power of our resources so that God can work the transformation that only God can do? As you pray and as you respond, we have our Deuteronomy basket up here. And we're going to close with a hymn, I'm going to live so God can use me. We are going to do our finances and our budgets and our resources in a way that God can use us. Every day, every way. Um, And as we sing, if you would bring your pledge cards forward and then we will bless them at the end of service.